Ross said, guys will never do anything in our careers that is going to be as significant as this. Welcome to Beyond the Lens, presented by Diesel Films. I am Seth Shapiro. And I'm AJ Speaks. A three-time Peabody Award winner, George Roy set the standard for documentary filmmaking during the golden era of HBO Sports. Roy and his partner Steve Stern emerged from an illustrious production roster at MLB Productions to start their own shop, Black Canyon Productions. In 1991, through a stroke of Yiddish luck, we'll get to that later, they created what many hailed as the greatest baseball documentary ever made, when it was a game for HBO, and the rest was history. Roy's catalog is extensive, and we get into several of his films, including The Curse of the Bambino, where he made an executive decision that surprised the powers that be at HBO Sports. You won't ever guess which member of the 1992 Dream Team was involved in a moment on set that George will never forget. And we get into his latest work with the WWE Legends. It's another great conversation on Beyond the Lens, presented by Diesel Films. Before we had 30 for 30, before we had Netflix, we had HBO Sports, which was the gold standard for sports documentaries. And on today's show, we have someone who played a pivotal role in setting that gold standard, director George Roy. George, welcome to Beyond the Lens. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Listen, George, we're excited to have you. I think 1991, you dropped one of your classic films. Forty years later, you dropped WWE Legends. In your vision, what has changed the most in the business? I think probably from where I sit, probably the technology. You know, we've all gotten used to doing things remotely. And over the course of the last year, that really had ratcheted up. And if it weren't for technology, God knows how much of our previous life we would have been able to kind of hold together with the remote editing and the VPN lines. And I think a lot of the, the advancements in the field with some of the cameras and so forth. I think beyond that, though, I mean, I think that the heart of most great docs is the ability for someone to tell a story. So with all the technology and all that's changed, that I think sort of has remained the same and is at the heart of, I think, any good doc. So, George, we usually like to break up the podcast into three acts, but since your filmography is so extensive, <laughs> this will be more like this is your life. Oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> No, but for uh, real, it's like you're trying to pick one book. You have like a million, like when it was a game and all the way through, like we couldn't just pick one. So we had to, we kind of got to go through it. Okay. Yeah. So George, where did you grow up and where did your love for sports and storytelling intersect? I actually grew up in uh, North Jersey, one of five kids. My parents were both avid sports fans and they were both New Englanders. So my mom was from North Andover and my dad was from Salem. So Kind of grew up in a kind of on a hybrid sports family. Like we love the Mets, but we also loved the Red Sox and like Yaz and Bobby Orr and Larry Bird and all. They were kind of my heroes, even though I was in New Jersey because I had that connection to my family and I'd go visit my cousins up and we'd go to Red Sox games. And, you know, it was just sort of one of these things where just through the years, uh, the love of sports, particularly Boston and New York, just remained a part of me, which was sort of an odd combination to have, particularly among some of my friends back then, you know. Was there a professor, a teacher, or somebody that sort of helped transition you into film? If you, we found that the common thread has been there's been a role model or a mentor. Who was that person for you, if, if it existed? When I graduated from high school, I really had no idea of really kind of what I wanted to do. I mean, I was a huge sports fan. I love movies, and I love music, and I kind of love pop culture. And I was a typical teenager and I didn't really know what to do. So I actually went to the same college that my parents had gone to. Unlike kids today where the college thing becomes such a big experience and kids have tutors and they're going on trips and they've got, you know, the pennants of the schools on their walls in their rooms. I really had no idea what I wanted to do. So I went there for a couple of years and kind of felt things out. And I just kind of had the itch. I was involved in the radio station at school and I began to kind of become more interested in things beyond what I was doing. And I thought, oh, you know, I'd, I'd like to get into television or movies. And at first I thought maybe I wanted to get in behind the camera, like a news person or something. So I went to Emerson College after I graduated. And still at that point, sports and Emerson really didn't mix. It was much more of a kind of a liberal, very progressive school at the time, small. Uh, met some good friends there. Just by happenstance, I was home one summer and I ran into an old buddy of mine down at a softball field and he was working for Major League Baseball Productions in uh, 1983. He said, hey, you know, drop me a line after you graduate and uh, I'll hook you up. So I called and he brought me in and 
the rest is history. I started there in May of 83, sort of as a viewer, you know, like sitting there in a stool, like viewing highlights and marking things for the producers, great plays, bloopers and, and the like cutaways. And things just took off. And I think you asked the question about role models. I think I was lucky and fortunate. I started at MLB because at the time there were some really, really great people there who went on to do really great things. You know, there was Mike Tolan was there, Gary Cohn was there, Chris Martens was there, who's an ESPN guy, Willie Weinbaum, whom you guys most likely know it, Mark Duran, Joe Levine, Sean Mooney, Chris Chambers, all these guys oh. went on to do great things. And I was dropped in the middle of this environment and you just couldn't help but learn and be around these guys. And MLB at the time was an unusual place because they encouraged you to do everything. You went out in the field, you edited, you wrote your own pieces. Uh, it was not like coming up at a network where you were kind of, you know, you had a department or a compartment. You were expected to do everything. And at the time it was a bit overwhelming, but looking back at it, it was a, kind of the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I kept the editing piece as a part of who I was throughout my entire career. And I enjoy that part of the process more so than any. And if I wasn't at MLB at the time, I probably would have been pigeonholed as a field producer or as a line producer thing where back then we were, you know, here's your yellow pad and do the show, you know, and so that was it. How did you meet Steve Stern and how was Black Canyon Productions formed? Steve was at uh, MLB. I forgot to mention his name. He was there a year before me and we just kind of hit it off. We had kind of similar personalities and enjoyed spending time with one another and admired each other's sort of creative abilities. And I was there for a while. By the time 1988 rolled around, we, him and I started kind of, you know, entertaining the idea, maybe going to do something on our own. We left in 1988. Him and I had formed a pretty good relationship with the uh, Dodgers at that time, the O'Malley's and Barry Stockhammer and Paul Khalil and guys who were kind of running the Los Angeles Dodgers. And for some reason, which I still to this day don't understand, we left and we called them and said, listen, we're leaving MLB. They had had a 25 year relationship with major league baseball productions but we asked them if we could do their highlight film <laughs> and, they, and, they, and much to our surprise they said yeah we would love to have you guys we love working with you guys and maybe they had a little bit of an issue with major league baseball at the time who knows so they gave us the 88 highlight film and you guys as sports fans <laughs> know what happened that year it was a pretty magical year so when as soon as gibby launched that one over the fence we thought well we're we got a pretty good film here and we kind of maintained a good relationship with them. And then two years later, they had their 100th anniversary. And we went back to them again and said, listen, you know, we'd love to do your film. And they said, yeah, we'd love to have you. And then so we did that. And out of that experience, the sort of the genesis for when it was a game was formed, because we established a relationship with a wine keeper, believe it or not, by the name of Meyer Robinson, who owned the Manischewitz Wine Company in Brooklyn at the time, who was a huge Dodger fan. And somehow we got hooked up with him and he took us over to his house and showed us some color home movies of the Dodgers, uh, Jackie and Campy and Duke and Pee Wee. And we were like blown away because we were at Major League Baseball. We were at MLB for five years and I had never seen color images of these players. And like we like it was just sort of a magical moment where we kind of knew we had something, but at that time, we didn't quite know what yet. We used it in that film. We were able to get it to HBO eventually, and then that whole relationship started. Wow. So that leads us into that question about that relationship. How did you create that relationship with HBO and Ross Greenberg at the time? Ross uh, was always sort of a friend. We had done some stuff with them, and Steve had known him before. He had written a couple of the Wimbledon films, and so we had a relationship with Ross, but not a very tight working relationship. It was more of a personal one. Seth Abraham was there at the time and they were kind of like one and one A in terms of running the, the department. And uh, Seth was a huge Dodger fan. And so our pitch to them was take a look at all this film that we have of the Dodgers. And they immediately just were stunned. They, they were like, oh my God, Seth in particular loved Jackie Robinson. And it was kind of an easy sell at the time to get them interested. But our thought at the time, not knowing how much of it we were ever going to find, and this was pre-Google and pre-the internet, it was you know 1990, 1991. We just thought to ourselves logically, if there was a Meyer Robinson in Brooklyn, there has to be one in Boston, there has to be one in Pittsburgh, there has to be one in Cincinnati. There's got to be fans who have 
great, either great seats or relationships with players, or at the time, the players as premium items for appearing on radio shows with Red Barber and people like that would get these new 16 millimeter Bell and Howell movie cameras and we'd get reels from them and it'd be a, a birthday party or Thanksgiving. And then seven minutes later, there'd be a, you know, 10 minutes of the spring training in 1938 in color. So we like, <laughs> we started with fans and then we worked our way to players. And then after about a year, year and a half, we had about 70 or 80 hours of the stuff. So then wow. we went back to them and said, here's our concept. We want to do a film that is sort of like a scrapbook of hit baseball history, but people who went to these games as kids, as 12 and 13, 14, 15 year old kids back in the 40s and 50s are gonna be brought back to their childhood because newsreels were in black and white. So the last memories they had of baseball that looked like this was when they were sitting in these stadiums with their fathers and their friends. And so that's sort of why and how when it was a game became so magical because it kind of transported that baseball fan back to his childhood. I never thought Manischewitz wine would be mentioned on this podcast. <laughs> it's like bringing back old Passover memories. It's always a first. And if there's going to be one, why not be Manischewitz, right? <laughs> exactly. Did HBO know it was going to go on an extensive run of doing sports documentaries in the sports department? Was, or did this kind of launch that initiative? I think it probably launched it. You know, Ross obviously is an astute guy and uh, storyteller himself. I guess at some point when he saw and their audience saw how well this resonated on HBO and it kind of fit their profile of being sort of uh, an esteemed network that shows high quality programming, even if it was sports. I think it was a combination of a couple different things and they were able to from that point on, make a commitment to do, you know, four of these a year. And they did that for a long time with some really good people and did some really great stuff. Obviously, like you said in the opening before, uh, the 30 for 30 is sort of take it to a new level, you know. Part of your storytelling style, read a quote where you said you have to deal with balancing comprehensiveness with being interpretive. What do you mean by that? The interpretive part, I think, is maybe a clarity, having uh, something that's imminently watchable that you could be sitting there with your wife or your girlfriend or someone who knows nothing about or a buddy of yours who's not a sports fan who doesn't know anything about this particular subject or topic will five minutes in be kind of hooked as if he's watching or she's watching a story just about someone whom they somehow find some interest in and that was the challenge with some of the wrestling stuff because it has this sort of stigma of being you know, there's a demographic that somehow wrestling and these guys uh, appeal to and to kind of crack the code and to figure out a way in which anyone who watches a show uh, would enjoy it is challenging. And I think when I set out to do a film, that's always sort of the 30,000 foot view. I, I always wanted to make it like imminently watchable, not simple, but emotionally appealing to virtually anyone who will watch it. How do you go about doing that? Because sometimes it's just so, it seems so challenging, but it seems like a great goal, but it just seems like a really tough goal to achieve. Yes and no. I mean, I think that maybe every once in a while you stop and you call your wife into the office and have her watch <laughs> something back or your daughter can come in and watch it. Or, you know, you just, you think back at previous things and work that you've done and why did things resonate the way they did? And, you know, sometimes when things get too complicated or you get, you know, two inside baseball on some things, you know, you're missing out on a, on a larger audience. And I just think it's, it comes with experience, but I think it also comes with knowing your audience and sort of challenging yourself to try to create something that might be more appealing than sort of something that would be geared towards an ardent fan of something. I definitely think it's a gift and, and it, you accomplish it because I, I've been with people and they, they have no interest and then they're sucked in and you're just like, damn, you know, you got them. <laughs> to me, that seems like that's what your goal is. And when you achieve it, you know, well done. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I mean, it happens sometimes it happens easier and with more success than with others. But I think if that could be part of the process, I think the film is always better off for it. I wanted to ask a two part question. Through your years at HBO, who is your favorite character? And also, who is your toughest interview or protagonist to crack? Ooh, 
my favorite character, that would probably be two people. I think uh, Tommy Smith from the 1968 Olympics, this of Freedom. I think as you guys know from being in the business, when the takeaway from an experience includes cultivating uh, a relationship with someone in the film who you knew nothing about going in and who in Tommy's case, I wouldn't say I was intimidated, but you know, I was just a little bit guarded, uh, not not guarded, but just a little bit, you know, I, like I, I didn't know how to, to to formulate a relationship with him beyond an interview subject. And that's sort of what I really wanted to do. And these projects are always better off for it. So I went out there and we sat, we had lunch, we talked a lot and we formed a pretty interesting and a really genuine bond that sort of carried through the entire show. And then we maintained a relationship to some degree after the, the show as well. And I would say that was a similar experience with, and op, clearly opposite of Tommy, but uh, Margaret Lambert, who was a Jewish German high jumper, who was the center of this uh, film that I'd done for HBO called Hitler's Pawn. I maintained a really solid friendship with years after the film had aired. And she lived to, to be 103 years old. She lived in Queens, New York. And we would trade Christmas cards and we'd go to lunch, you know, once a year. And it's just sort of those sorts of things that there's a lot of interviews that you remember, but the takeaway on, at least from where I sit, you remember the sort of the relationships and the people that you met doing it. Maybe not toughest, but the one negative experience I remember was dealing with Christian Leitner. <laughs> <laughs> AJ is a big Duke fan. I didn't see that coming. Go oh, ahead. Tell man. us that story. Oh, man. And I and I like Christian. I mean, I think he's a he's a fun character, and I certainly admire his tenacity and his. I mean, his. I mean, there's in my mind, there's not a better college player ever. But I, I don't. Know, I maybe just kind of caught him at a bad time. It was before the really cool uh, "I Hate Christian Leitner" piece on ESPN that I loved. I don't know. He was just sort of in a bad way. He was going through some bad things. I think he had that issue with Scotty Pippen, who had lent him a bunch of money, and he had gone that his real estate stuff in Durham had kind of gone south a little bit, and he was just in a I don't know. And we sat to do the interview and I didn't know from, I didn't know what he was expecting me to ask him, but right before he got started, he leaned over and ripped the questions out of my hand and looked at him and then took like the third page of the interview and, and threw it on the ground. And I was like, all right, well, I said, was there anything in there that you found particularly <laughs> offensive or upsetting? And he said, no, 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 I just, you know, I didn't know, I, I, I don't know the, who the hell you are, and I didn't know what you were going to ask me, and I said, well, you know, I, it, whatever you were thinking is not going to be the case. I don't know whether you thought I was from ex, Extra or Inside Edition or, or what, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was an experience that I remember. Um, we rebounded pretty quickly as we got, I mean, he's a pro, so as we got into it, he was, he was fine, but that, that, was, uh, that was something that I didn't expect from him. That leads me into a question about your interview style. Do you have a tendency to talk to them beforehand in some cases, maybe with Tommy and Margaret, and sort of try to get them to be open and vulnerable? Or do you just approach it where, hey, you come in and what is your style? Let me ask you that way. I like to talk to them, but what I talk to them about is is often not directly correlated to kind of what I would ask them in the interview setting. I think a lot of folks, a lot of my colleagues do a lot of extensive pre-interviewing. And I don't know about you guys, but I've always found out that, you know, you're interviewing someone and they say something so great over the phone, you know, <laughs> you can't then, get them to say it yeah. again. <laughs> and then you get to the interview and you're thinking, oh, man, I'm just hoping this guy spits that out again. And then <laughs> yeah. often then you end up asking him five or six times and you end up in your mind, you're piecing together the soundbite that you originally got so seamlessly yeah. on the phone. Right. So yeah. and, and kinda, they say, like I said, like I said on the phone, <laughs> yeah. you're like, no, I don't want that. Like, no, exactly. like, let's not forget about that. Exactly. So after experiencing that like 50 times and being so frustrated and say, why, why couldn't he or she, she just say what she told me on the phone? You know, it would have been so great. I now will talk to them. And just from the point of view of getting a sense of how aware they are of what's going on currently, or we'll talk about something, or there might be somebody, a friend of theirs that I had dealt with a while, just to get a sense of, you know, what they know, how they can deliver something. You talk to them generally about maybe what you're going to talk about. But I find that the deeper you go, the sort of the more frustrating you end up being, uh, at least at times when you go to talk to them for real, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. try to leave a lot of that meat on the bone, you know, for showtime, you know. So mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of worked a little bit better for me. I wanted to ask, are there any stories you wish you could have told, whether it was at HBO or, or somewhere else? 
I, for the longest time, wanted to do Roberto Clemente. Mm -hmm. I just loved that guy so much. He was like one of my childhood heroes. We had something lined up with PBS at one point, and then either the financing fell through or something happened with the family. And they ended up doing it thereafter with another production group. I either was involved in another project or maybe there was a, a management turnover at PBS. And I, they never circled back. Beyond that, there were some non-sports figures that I found would be interesting. I always thought it would be cool to do something on, you know, Bruce Springsteen or something like somebody who's I idolized and looked up to as a kid and find a lot of quality in their work. And I've often paralleled it to folks I've met sort of on the athletic field, you know, but beyond that, not really. Now you've done a ton of rivalry stories. You've done a ton of just focusing on teams. Is there any stories that you got into and you're like, man, this, I did not expect this to go this way. I don't know if it's Dean Smith or any of these stories that you've done where you're just like, this took me in a different direction, but you're appreciative for it. Uh, yeah, I think you find that in, uh, in just about all of them. You know, I've always thought when I approach these uh, films that the, the part that I get the most satisfaction out of is, I think, from where most people sit, sort of the least likely area. I really enjoy and I take a lot of pride in the research phase. You know, I think that uh, we talked about technology earlier and about how things are changing. I think there's so many great young filmmakers out there, but I think the technology to some degree has kind of short circuited the importance of that initial phase, you know, like I'll literally get like 10 or 12 books and get on Nexus Lexus and just dig and dig and dig and talk to people in hopes of just finding one line in one little chapter of a book somewhere that maybe no one's seen or and you can add, you know, put it in to your piece somehow. And like people are like, geez, like the Bret Hart thing that we just put on. People get a kick out of the fact that Bret, before he became a wrestling champion, you know, he wanted to go to film school. So I read in his book in a one line that he had done this eight millimeter film with one of his friends. And I thought to myself, I'm probably not even going to ask him, why would he even have this thing ever? So I was on the phone with him before we got started, really. And I said, you know, here on you know, page 367 on your book here, you talk about making an eight millimeter film between your high school year and when you started college. I said, I know this is a crazy question, but would you happen to have that? And he goes, I think I do. I think I do have that film. I think I do have that film. So I think that, that you kind of create these little scenarios through that digging and that hard work by which you can kind of surprise yourself in some ways, because if you challenge yourself from that point of view and really create a challenging process around the research part of your project, you can find things that surprise you yourself as a filmmaker. How many books would you say you read for Brett? Or let's say any of your Dean Smith, any of those, would you say you just read every book you could find? Or how did that research go? Well, it depends because a guy like Dean Smith, obviously, there's, I mean, there's been so many books yeah. writ written about him and for him. And he's been a parts of different things. Whereas Brett, his book is sort of the gold standard in wrestling books. Him and Mick Foley and I think Edge now have written books that, you know, been on the New York Times bestseller list. They're like real books. Um, and so beyond reading Brett's book, it's just kind of digging in and doing deep dives on the internet and just poking around on stuff and trying to connect into one thing. I use Nexus Lexus a lot, which is a sort of a subscription mm -hmm. service, which allows you to research beyond Google and old publications and magazines. And I was doing a lot of stuff in Calgary where they'll write from a different point of view. It's more local, you know, and stuff that we would never be able to access ourselves and University of Calgary at the Glenbo archives had a lot of interesting things too. So you just kind of, you kind of just throw a net around as much stuff as you can, you know, and uh, if there's multiple books, you read them. If not, you just go to different areas. Sometimes the research is more rewarding than interviewing the actual subject or doing the piece, because I remember watching Brett watching the, I think it was a lizard film Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the projection screen. And I was yeah. like, wow, like this is <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was, yeah, that was a film that we had gotten from him and then, uh, he had a hard time understanding what I was, what I meant. I said, yeah, we're going to shoot you watching the film and then we're going to interview you about it. And we're going to kind of create something that's going to show the audience that uh, you're much more than a wrestler, which he is. I mean, Brett's very artistic, interesting subject. People seem to kind of enjoy that 
part of the film too. It's anytime you can throw something out there that even the most serious Bret Hart fans don't know about, which is really hard to do now because these wrestling people know everything, you know? So yeah. it was, uh, that was pretty satisfying. They definitely know about the Montreal screw job. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> We've heard about that a million times. Yeah, I know. I, I wanted know. to ask you, I read an article <laughs> Speaking of research, 2005, HBO was spending 450 to $750,000 a documentary. Mm -hmm. Where have you seen budgets come from and where do you see them now? Sometimes we don't even get to see those type of numbers at this time. Yeah, I know. It was unusual for that period of time, but that's the sort of the commitment they were making to that sports franchise. Their way of doing business, and it was fortunate for people like me who were, you know, right time, right place was that they were going to spend money on quality programming and the people they got involved and the subjects that they did, they spared little expense in creating these films because they were part of the HBO brand. You know, that was their brand, you know, we're the, we're the best. Where they've gone, I mean, I, I guess it depends upon who you speak to. There are still places that spend that kind of money, whether they're on our documentaries is a different story. I'm not that knowledgeable in regards to sort of where we are in the reality world or where we are in different worlds because my space is pretty limited to i wouldn't say the historical doc but these sort of comprehensive life story narrative docs i think most folks who are still in that game you know those budgets are fairly comparable but you're right when you're talking about you know the mid 90s and the early 2000s and it's 2021 and we're talking about the same number <laughs> But, yeah. you know, that's just sort of where HBO was at the time. It was a good place to be for a long time. I'm curious, speaking of HBO, of your thoughts now with the ESPN 30 for 30s, the directors, the producers are getting a lot of attention and a lot of props. You deserve that same attention and props, but a lot of it went to HBO. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on how that has evolved? Yeah, I mean, you always have, as a filmmaker, you always question yourself and why that was the case back then. When When It Was a Game came out, you know, it was HBO's When It Was a Game. It was sort of part of their programming strata, and it was just sort of, you knew that going in. You know, you were afforded a nice budget. You knew they were gonna promote the hell out of it. So if you do three or four, five good shows for them, eventually people were gonna kind of connect you as a director and as a producer or creator to those projects, you know, whether it was, those were the days where, you know, it was Phil Mushnick and Rudy Marsky. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't like the internet today where people, every single minute of your show being on, you can go on Twitter and see how people are reacting to it. It was an HBO brand and you were, as a young filmmaker, you felt fortunate to be connected to that. I did think it was a great thing for ESPN to sort of changed the paradigm a little bit when it came to acknowledging directors. I think as a result, they attracted more quality directors and filmmakers to their side of the fence because they knew that credit was there and they knew that it was just a, a different way for a network to promote these things. The people that they had gotten to come over and did them, obviously, you know, when you're talking about Ezra Edelman and Jason Hare and people like that, they showed that they could deliver. So it worked for both entities. But to me, like a person like yourself, and I know you'll be humble, but you laid the groundwork for a lot of that. And I don't think that all of that always comes across. Like when I go back and look at UNLV, the UCLA piece, Ohio State, like that was all you. You know, Jason Heron and them are, do a great job and have gotten their proper props. But to me, I just want to make sure you recognize that because for us doing this research, it's like, man, he did that. Oh, OK. He did shot hurt around the world. I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. He did all of those things. You know what I mean? So. I just yeah, had to put that out there. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. And it, you know, it wasn't all me. I mean, I had a, a lot to do with it. Steve Stern, my writing partner and production partner, played a big role as well. From a big, big picture point of view, you know, understood narrative, understood storytelling. Ross, obviously, was always there. Always knew when something took a left turn and should be brought back. As a production executive, his feel for these sorts of things was and is unparalleled. So it was just, it was just a good time for, for all of us back then. I do appreciate you saying that. Those stories were pretty fertile at the time too. So they kind of 
Yeah. They were there. They were they were ripe for the taking, you know. And for me, it was our place to get those documentaries. We didn't have ESPN doing documentaries like that. You know, that was the place you would go. You go to HBO and you'd see, you know, the Curse of Bambi. You see all of these, and you're like, oh, okay, a new one's coming. You know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. being an HBO intern alum, I was a little biased, but I just, <laughs> you know, it was definitely good to see all of those things. And now I'm happy for all those young filmmakers that are doing that. You're right. They became part of the HBO brand. They became events. They became things that people like yourself look forward to. Kind of like the golf schedule. They were the majors. You know, they had four of them on a year and people looked forward to them. And just when you got away from one of them, there'd be another one cooking up around the corner. We did a brilliant job at brainstorming, co-selecting topics and figuring out when to put things on, you know, 10th anniversary of this, the 20th anniversary of that. It was an Olympic year. We figured out ways to sort of crystal ball these things too. So they backed into periods of time when they were promoted. They were often supported by a bigger mm -hmm. event that they sort of fit into. There was a gentleman there who recently retired. His name was Ray Stallone, who was the head of the public relations there. And he was as responsible for the success of these films as, as anyone, because he just knew how to get them out, what buttons to push in regards to sort of getting feature pieces written about these things. But during that period of time, they were a big deal. Yeah, and I appreciate you remembering them. Definitely appointment viewing, as well as the boxing at that time, they were just special events and the documentaries fit into that uh, schedule. Yeah, I wanted to step back a little bit. I think in the late 90s, I was able to walk through your office once for some, I don't know why, but it was a cramped small office. All I remember is just seeing tapes. <laughs> I believe it was just tapes on tapes on tapes. I think there was a bird jersey up there, some Converse weapons. Yeah. in another side of the office. Talk about that environment, that experience. I mean, it was really, I think at that time for you guys, it was the heyday of what you were creating. Yeah, no, the, the, the tapes were, uh, you know, they, they made for a good backdrop for a photo op of a typical small sports production company, right? I mean, without them, it's not like today where everything's on drives and the digital world has shrunk things to the point where, you know, I could be sitting in an airport now and be editing a piece, you know, whereas back then you needed to reach over and grab four or five tapes and <laughs> later on start digitizing stuff and things like that. But when you do these films through that period of technology, when you're dealing first with the, you know, three quarter inch machines and the 800s, and then you're graduating to beta SP and things like that, the tapes. And I remember going on shoots, you know, and have to come back and, you know, you had, you're carrying with two big bags of tapes and you got to get them hand checked at the airport. And, you know, you do 20 shows and each show's got, you know, 250 tapes and we never want to throw them out. Right. So they begin to add up, you know, we mentioned Steve DeGroote earlier. If you go into his office nowadays, his office looks exactly like that. So it's, <laughs> he's still a tape guy. Uh, I remember those days. That office was near HBO, right? Near 42nd Street? Yeah, we had a couple of them. I don't know, uh, Seth, maybe were you on the one um, by IMG down on 49th between 9th and 10th? Because we were there and then we, we hopped all over the place. I think we... it was the West Side, if I remember correctly. Okay. But I just remember being blown away by, you know, this is where the magic happens. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You could yeah. tell it. You could tell it was happening there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or this is where the Mets happens, one or the other. <laughs> So I have to dive in a little bit. Like we said, we didn't dive into too many of your specific documentaries on the show. We like to dive into one, but I'm just going to ask you about The Curse of the Bambino. Mm -hmm. You know, that one to me just kind of stood out. How did that documentary come about? And then overview, what was your final take on the on the entire documentary? That was one of my favorite ones, having been a Red Sox fan, you know, going to games and watching games, you know, the 1918 chant you know became such a big deal and was such a you know an albatross for the red sox and they had become you know really like a scarred team you know i don't know it's like 2003 and red sox had begun to you know commit themselves financially to putting some good players on the field i forget how or why hbo said they wanted to do it but i just kind of went in there and i said this is a great story at the time we didn't quite know how to approach it because I didn't want to approach it in a basic, mm -hmm. standard, straightforward way. It's kind of like a big cartoon. You know, I was never big on recreations. I, I always feel like they're, they never really quite work. But somehow we just started noodling around with this curse figure, you know, this guy we would put in Fenway Park and we would go back to him and have all this eerie music. It was funny because uh, you guys probably know Tom Stuka, a really good DP, uh, Brian Lockhart 
who now obviously B Lock is at ESPN. Brian was working with me on that show from like he was like the the art director. And so him and I went up to Fenway Park for a couple days and we were like, Man, when are we gonna do this shoot? It's the, the weather was so bad. And finally we just looked at one another and said, We gotta do it. We got it was pouring raining in Fenway Park the entire day. And somehow with that rain and the way that Tom shot that curse figure shoot that we did and that guy that we had who was a college baseball player at the time and we got this Babe Ruth uniform and he, he had the swagger you know, like he was an athlete so he mm-hmm. kind of pulled off all the body language with the standing against the bat and swinging and doing all sorts of different things that was really inspiring we came back and we thought geez we can really make something interesting out of this Brian Keene who's a composer that I've used many many times through the years came up with this brilliant theme this curse theme and it was very kind of like you know, like Stephen King sort of like. And then we put the piece together and I said to Ross at one point, I said, because he kind of let me go for a couple months and we talked and he goes, how's it going? I said, it's going good. He goes, oh, who have you interviewed? And he was expecting me to reel off a whole bunch of players. And I said, the only player I've interviewed so far is Bucky Dent. I said, I'm just going to interview all fans. I said, this is a story about the Boston sports fans. I don't want to interview Ted Williams or, or, um, you know, Yaz or, Jim Longboard. This is their story. And at first, he, he had a fit. He's like, Yeah, I was yeah. about to say, I know he didn't take that. <laughs> no, it's no, like, no. Yeah. yeah, no. He's like, what? <laughs> that wasn't his MO. <laughs> it didn't it didn't take him long to 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 get it. And he was he wasn't overly resistant to it, but he was like, Yeah, yeah, you sure about that? And I was like, Yeah, yeah. I said, wait till you see this thing. And the fans just carried that thing. They were so passionate about what it was like to lived their whole lives and families that had gone through year after year after year being frustrated and coming close in 1986. And so it kind of worked. And then, you know, you do these things long enough and you guys have probably had this experience. It's just like this kismet moment. It's like almost opposite of the SI curse. Like I had such a great run. Like I do a film and like good things would happen. Like people would call me all the time and say, how did you know? How did you know? And in the next year they won the world series. Yes, yes. So it's like, geez, like, it's like, what happened? So, <laughs> like, I look back at that experience and it's like, man, there was just something so fateful about that whole thing. Like, I got the opportunity to do this film at such a level, you know, mm-hmm. with HBO and have such great people working with me on it. And then the following year, they turn around and my son is eight years old at the time. And he's just smitten with the Johnny Damons and Kevin Millars and Kurt Schilling. I mean, he's just so into the Red Sox and to have that whole experience come to a head where they won the following year. Then of course, you know, two days after they won, I was like calling Ross. I said, man, we got to do a, we got to do a follow up to this thing. (laughs) So that's when the reverse of the curse thing happened. And that was, that was fun as well. Appreciate you picking that one out because you know, that was one of my favorites. People didn't buy into the curse thing necessarily because they had always attached Dan Shaughnessy to it. And Dan Mm kind of runs hot and cold in Boston a little bit. You either love him or you hate him. And, I happen to like Dan a real lot, but the whole curse thing became something that people began to make fun of and dismissed and rightly so. But I just felt like it was just such a warm knife through butter theme that we've got to we got to use it because people outside of Boston will appreciate the story, too, because it was so big, you know, and it involved Babe Ruth and it involved John F. Kennedy and people like, you know, it was it was bigger than just a sports story, you know. Well, I have to ask you, I'm a Met fan. Seth's a Red Sox fan. You said you were both. I just when want you- to thank you for doing that shoot because I feel like that was a voodoo doll we needed. I'm going to gonna let you get to that. I'm going to let you get to that, Seth. I just want to know when you made the change, Roy. Like, when did you leave our Mets and go to the Sox? Well, I still root for the Mets. I mean, you grew up about- with Cohen. You said you were in Cohen. Now, this is the voice of the Mets. Like, y'all yeah, go way back. I know. Well, the impetus behind my Met fan dumb was my mom was a, was a huge Met fan. She loved Ed Cranepool and Tom Seaver and Bud Harrelson and Rusty Staub. And so I grew up, and I was 10 years old in 1969. So now, now you know how old I am. You know, when you're that age and your parents are glued to the TV set watching the Mets in that particular year, you just like, it just stays with you. There's just some things that you just can never shake, you know? You know, by the time we got to 86, I was kind of rooting for the, for the Red Sox just because they hadn't won in Mm -hmm. so long. And I thought, well, it's been a long time since the Mets had won. I don't know. I I wouldn't say I ever really switched because I'll watch like a Jacob DeGrom game. It'd be like, of course, every five days. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the whole fan thing goes out. I just appreciate, yeah. and you know they're they got a fun team this year, so they're they're they've been fun to watch. 
George, I want to ask you as a production company owner myself, what were some of the challenges having a company with a partner and then also take us to what happened to Black Canyon Productions? You know, you, you, you have your, your ups and downs, usually dealing with pitching things and not being successful all the time. You know, you just you get to the point where we were pretty spoiled in our HBO run and didn't realize at times how hard it was to really get a show on the air. And we experienced a decent amount of that sort of in the post HBO run when, you know, Ross Greenberg left and HBO sort of changed their management style and their approach to these shows and to the point where they really started minimizing the sort of the, the HBO sports staff approach to these things. And they began to kind of pull people away and they just, that department eventually just sort of it just fizzled away, which was really too bad. So I think that we got some reality when we would learn that, you know, we were pretty fortunate for all those years to finish a project and have someone say, all right, well, what do you want to do next? Come back to us with two or three ideas. And we were in a real pocket for the longest period of time and very lucky and very fortunate to have, like I said, been in the right time and the right place. And you find out afterwards that there's a whole nother group of younger, you know, talented, really enthusiastic, you know, younger guys who are now forming relationships with people they've known for a long time coming through. Like the whole first wave of the whole ESPN 30 for 30 thing was made up of a whole group of younger guys who are really, really good at, and girls who are really good at what they did and really passionate about the stories they wanted to tell and how they wanted to tell them. It was challenging to kind of circle back and to fit into a different slot because we were the HBO guys, you know, for so long. The whole Black Canyon thing sort of ran its course, but it ran its course in a real positive way because in 1998, we were actually bought by Clear Channel, which at the time was good for us. It was exciting. It was a new direction for us to be working in a bigger entity. We were there for four or five years. There were some really good parts of it, and there were some parts that we thought to ourselves, well, you know, at least we were bought. That was a good thing, and we'll get th we'll get through the next couple of years and then figure things out. So it was an interesting time. When it comes to other filmmakers, are there any that you admire, and who would they be? Yeah, and there's a lot of guys that I've worked with, you know, like Joe Levine, who I worked with a lot at Major League Baseball and then HBO, is, a, is someone who I really like. The first filmmaker who I really idolize was a guy by the name of Phil Tuckett. He worked at NFL Films, and Phil did a film called Autumn Ritual in 1986 and it blew me away it was like a life-changing experience for me to the point where i like reached out to him like afterwards and i started to do things and people started to kind of know who i was and i reached out to him at one point i told him how much that film meant to me and it was a real game changer and i think steve sable actually I, that was, it was his vision too and it's a film that it was a football film but it co-opted the point of views of different people it wasn't players or coaches it was a lot of artists in it and there were a lot of people musicians and like i remember max weinberg and the poet ginsburg and g gordon liddy and he had all sorts of different people in this football film and to me I thought to myself wow this guy did something that you know really spoke to me and i kept that the missive of and the narrative of that film always sort of stayed with me and like i think it really helped me a lot when i started to do the hbo work you know that there are more to these stories and just the results of the games and this, there's different points of view that you can introduce to a film. And if you ever have a chance to look at it, I don't know if it's on YouTube or Google or whatever, it, it holds up pretty well. And it's, to me, it, it really opened up a lot of things in my head, you know, it's like, and I, and I told Phil that, and I think if there was one guy back then that I sort of thought was a bit of a role model, it would be, it would have been him. Well, it connects back to what you said earlier about looking at it from a different point of view and pulling people in that may not be connected, which also yeah. connects to the curse of the Bambino and why you got fans. So it all sort of makes sense and comes full circle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And, I think uh, the I think the voice, the narration for that was used in the open of Hard Knocks uh, for the, was it Oakland Raiders? Was it the last year in Oakland? Or was it Las Vegas? I forget. But oh, for the yeah. Raiders, Hard Knocks. The autumn winds changing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, no, it was it was it was a, it was a good film. I mean, really good and you know, different from any sports film that I had seen up to that point. And it was really it was really pretty inspiring. 
I wanted to ask you, George, a lot of people were disappointed with the changes at HBO Sports, losing boxing, sports documentaries, not emphasize as much. What do you think was the turning point there? And, you know, how do you feel about how things have changed? I could only comment on that from sort of afar. You know, I don't really know exactly why or how or what the motivation was for the change ultimately. Uh, and it did come at, a, at an unfortunate time for some really good people that had done some really good work for a long time. There was a, from what I have been told, there was a shift of the West Coast in regards to how and to what degree agents and so forth began to sort of get involved with television production, sports television production. They minimized the importance of the New York crew and the staff that they had. And I think it probably began and ended with Ross actually leaving. And he was sort of the, he was the bloodline. He was the heart and soul of HBO Sports, particularly when it came to documentaries. It's a shame because there was some really great people there and they had established a really great brand. I couldn't tell you Ross definitely could tell you a lot more. And uh, from what I understand, there's somebody writing a book about it, too. I mean, I can't be certain. I think he might have been the, the guy who wrote the big book on uh, on ESPN a couple of years back. So that story will probably be told in that form. Yeah, it's, it's really too bad that they couldn't have kind of coexisted with uh, the 30 for 30 franchise because they kind of HBO kind of left when the sort of the modern day sports fan really started to get plugged into these shows. And modern day, I mean... You know, people on Twitter and people like things would trend and people would chat about certain shows and things like The Last Dance and stuff would become cultural. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that people's capacity for watching these things is so far different than they once were. You know, the idea that someone's going to watch a nine or 10 hour, you know, sports show like the Michael Jordan show. And HBO sort of was the, you know, the precursor to all that sort of stuff and for them not to sort of exist in the environment in which those shows now really take flight and are really embraced by a younger audience, which is which is great, too. Absolutely. I think when HBO hired Bill Simmons, I think that went down the wrong road. In yeah, my opinion. I, <laughs> I think so. I was long gone by then. You know, I think his 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 work or at least his work on TV sort of speaks for itself. I mean, I think I'm, I'm not really in his demo in terms of reading his columns. I know that the ringer and I know that he's done some great stuff through the years may or may, may not have been responsible for the 30 for 30 stuff. That's sort of just what I hear or what he says. But, you know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, George, we're going to get in some quick hitters. You don't have to dive too deep. Uh, just sure. get your uh, take on a few things. What's your opinion on athlete produced documentaries? We see a lot of those now. I haven't watched a lot of them. That's probably my bad because I should probably be more receptive to other things. I think overall, I think they've been positive. I think the only negative would be that, you know, they tend to sort of monopolize areas that maybe would otherwise go to real producers or real directors or people who have a passion for a particular story. But with that said, I know that, you know, whether it's Kevin Durant or LeBron. I mean, I know obviously that they reach out and assemble, you know, as talented as a team as they can. And and they do. I mean, some of the stuff they've done has been really good. I, I, I just don't, to be honest with you, I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of it. I want to reserve anything that would be viewed as a critique. I think it's a way now that these things get traction. The, they're often starting on halfway between second or third or on third base when one of these guys is involved. When you go to pitch one of these things, it's easier to have someone attached to it that a production executive is going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, LeBron, yeah, all right, yeah, where, where, where am I going to sign? But that doesn't dismiss the work. The work, for the most part, I would assume has been really great, too. Do you prefer docs with voiceover or sound bites? I had never done one without a voiceover, you know, because we had Liev Schreiber all those years uh, at HBO. And, you know, you're not ever going to want to have him in your documentary, right? I do enjoy the ones that are just sound bites. I thought that I was going to struggle with it. I'd done these last two WWE ones with just sound bites. And I actually really enjoyed it. Not one time that I have to go back to Brett and say, you know, can you record this transition or can you I'm having a hard time getting from this to that. Can you help me out here or feed them a line? You know, when you interview so many people about the same topic and you do it as thoroughly as you possibly can, you often cut a film and you think, oh, geez, now I got to take out those three sound bites because I need the narrator to say that. But, you know, if you get to the point where you don't need the narrator, you just use the stuff you have. And it's been uh, 
it's been it's been fun. So I, I I think I now prefer to do the ones without the narration. To be honest with you, go to late night editing snack. A go to late night editing snack. Virtually anything. I mean, I'm I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big sweets guy. The problem with working in my house, you know, and I did the last I edited the, my last two films from my house is every I, I every 15 minutes I find myself down in the kitchen getting a bowl of potato chips or a couple cookies or coffee. Oh my God, coffee is just too much. I would say just virtually just about anything. I wish I could be a little more healthy, but I don't know. I always go to the, I always go to the junk food. <laughs> Favorite WWE legend. I have to say Brett, I mean, Brett Hart. No, because not, that was a loaded question. Huh? Yeah, that was yeah, yeah, yeah. If I didn't say it, it would somehow get back to him. And then <laughs> I'd be on his bad list. Outside of the Manischewitz wine story, what's the most memorable archive footage that you've ever found? We have a lot of great stuff. We have the 1938 uh, World Series in color. We have the only images of Lou Gehrig on the field in color. We have Wrigley Field in, in color before the Ivy in the mid-30s. We, Steve and Stern and myself, were really proud of the, some of the stuff we found in the early 90s. And we're actually hopefully pretty smart because we actually bought a lot of it and we own a lot of it. We often think with this crazy NFTs and all these things happening now that our archive could be worth something at one point because we've kind of got it in storage now. And when those storage bills come every month and it's costing us $500 to store the, the archive somewhere, we're hoping that it's got an afterlife in the, in this new internet world. We have a lot of, we, we, we have a lot of, um, Really cool baseball stuff uh, and some really great Olympic stuff, too, and some ABA stuff from when we did the ABA show for HBO. It's sort of our side business slash hobby. And every year that goes by, this stuff becomes a year older. So there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, NFT's taking off. So you guys may be taking off with it. Yeah, what, we'll see. what piece of advice would you give to our listeners who want to become filmmakers? You know, it's, it's, it's not unlike anything else. As you guys know, you know, people who your friends or family, you know, think that it's all glory. You know, you're, you got to interview this one or you got to interview that one. But as Seth and AJ, as you guys know, it's just as hard, if not harder than, than anything else. I mean, building your business, dealing with the realities of this world and how things change. It's just, you know, once you have a passion for it, just keep on, you know, working as, as hard as you, you can on it. You know, don't be afraid, particularly when you're young, to try different things as well. I think for me, I was really lucky, and, and I think this is an important thing for people to remember, to young filmmakers. I think your first, I don't want to say job, but your first couple experiences when you're young are really super important. You know, like um, take, take advantage of getting to know as many people as you can uh, and to be as helpful as you possibly can to people when you're young and you have an opportunity to work on a project with people, you know, try to somehow distinguish yourself one way or the other. And that's usually the guy who's in the edit room at, at 1230 at night, or the guy who's in there at seven o'clock in the morning, or the guy who runs a, a hard drive across the city, to, you know, the guy who's always there willing to do anything, or, or, or the girl or the woman who's there doing stuff that they really don't have to do are often the people that people like us you know, remember, you know, why don't we give him a chance? He was the guy that was in the edit room at one thirty in the morning, you know, uh, throwing away the Chinese food. Those are the sort of things that you want to do. Favorite sports documentary outside of one of your own? I don't know, man. I would say probably maybe like Murder Ball, maybe Board. I love the two Escobars, mm -hmm. When We Were Kings, a bunch of the old HBO stuff. Uh, do you believe in miracles? There, there's a lot of them. I like some of the old school ones. You know, uh, one day in September, you know, I like watch going back and watching the, the older ones, you know, those four or five are the ones that kind of stand out. Would you say you've had a seminal moment in your career and what would that be? I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I remember in 1991, we were in the mix. We were in the mix for uh, when it was a game. We were doing the mix and it was Steve Ross and myself, and this is 1991, it was the first thing basically that I had really ever done that really meant anything. Ross said, time, guys will never do anything in our careers <laughs> that is gonna be as significant as this. And I thought to myself, well, if this is the first thing that I'm doing, I said, this doesn't bode well for the rest of my career. <laughs> and I'm thinking, 
this guy, I mean, he, he's a smart guy, but he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But I swear, 2021, he might have been right. I mean, it was just like, it was just, you, you find yourself at a moment in time where you, you do something so unique and so different and so appreciated that everything from that moment on, I felt was really good, but it just, it wasn't as special as that for whatever reason. It just didn't tie folks together like that one did. I have to give him his props. He might've been right, you know? Sometimes the first thing that you do is always the best and you can never quite achieve that status again. I know, I know, I know. I don't know whether, that, I don't know whether that's good or bad. I'll take it either way. Last question from me. Who would you want to hear on this podcast? Oh, Steve DeGroot would be a good one. I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear Steve. Boy, I know, I, I like the Aaron Cohen one. I saw that one, I like that one. He set the tone. Yeah, I wrote, no. down, I wrote down Ray Stallone because I thought that that would be a different angle. Yeah, yeah. Ray's, Ray's good. I can get you his number if you want. We would like to get Ross and Rick, maybe. Yeah, they would be they would be great. Ross would definitely do it. Rick, I don't know. He might you have to get him off the golf course, you know. <laughs> but, but but Rick's a great guy. He, he he'd be happy to do it too. Dave too. Dave Harmon. Yes, my um, God. Yeah. Fuck Dave because Dave's got a little bit of a different experience in the live stuff, and he's probably one of the better live producers in the last. 25, 30 years when it comes to boxing, tennis, and a bunch of different things. But I'm sure you guys got a list of your own. I'm sure it's good, too. Absolutely. We really appreciate just your time and, and you spending time with us today. It's very educational, and, and uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. A huge thank you to the legend George Roy for going down memory lane with us on today's show. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you do, we'll give you a big shout-out or even bring you on. If you like what you heard, please share with your friends. We'll be back next week with another great episode of Beyond the Lens, and that's a wrap. And I'd like to give a special thanks to our editors, Jacob Gornberg and Andrew Holman, and our production assistant, Candace Evans.